Pence said they would fight the net as though it were an enemy weapons system. And now we've even got John Oliver actually exposing some of the Snowden snow jobs. So, James, what do we make of this sort of latest virtual flag bit of terrorism? It's an interesting story. From the perspective of studying the propaganda, there is probably no better example of how the establishment mouthpiece puppet media makes something out of nothing and makes a big international story that generates headlines around the world. This is a prime example of that, because if you go on to continue reading this article, you discover that not even the the White House or no one has actually said Russians. It's just these anonymous inside sources that apparently source from the CNN report um, that they did recently. This is not a new uh, hack. This happened months and months ago. It was talked about at the time, but now the new information is that CNN is learning that that some people off the record are pointing the figure at Russia using information that we, we don't have access to. So take this story for what it's worth, which is absolutely nothing, except, as I say, a good example of how the propaganda can be used to, at any time, they can just throw out a story like this to get you to hate Russia again. You know, oh, did you forget? We're supposed to be hating Russia right now. And uh, this is how it works. And it's it's quite effective when they do it this way, because if the White House came out and said we were hacked by the Russians, they'd have to at least demonstrate some sort of proof. They'd have to have something to it. But CNN can come out with an exclusive report from inside sources. So we've got to keep them off the record and, you know, anonymous because uh, they, they, they can't talk about ongoing investigations. But it was the Russians, guys. Yeah, OK, well, let's all get mad at them now. So um, I think this can be seen for the transparent propaganda that it is. And we're going to sound like broken records here, I predict, in the coming years, because this is going to be a theme that's going to reoccur time and time again as we see more and more of these types of cyber events happen. But let's remind everyone once again, with these types of events, there is absolutely no way for you or I or anyone else to verify any part of this story. We can't verify that these these uh, computers were uh, compromised or hacked in any way. We can't get access to the server logs to see where the, the hits were coming from, how they determined this was Russians rather than people spoofing IPs or whatever. Exactly like the Sony hack where we talked about the exact same phenomenon, exactly as I'm sure we're going to talk about in the future. Just because they come out and say, or anonymous officials don't come out and say, it was the Russians. Uh, well, give me something to actually look at. And uh, in this case, of course, they're not going to provide a shred of evidence for it. So we should not put a shred of faith in the credibility of this report. And you can see how this does kind of get into people's heads. I see the, the telescreens at my day job and I did see this story up on the mainstream media. It was Russia's, Russia hacks the White House. And for the people who get their news that way, they glance up, they see that thing. Oh, there's Russians. Oh, they hacked the White House. And they just file it away and, and believe it and never really ask another question. And look at the title of this this story. White House computers hacked by Russians. Absolutely definitive. First, first sentence, Russian hackers penetrated a White House computer system. Again, definitive declarative statements. And then further on, it says, well, they won't even acknowledge, the White House won't even acknowledge that, that they're blaming the Russians for this. Uh-huh. So, James, let's now move to our second story this week, where a law has been changed so nuclear waste dumps can be forced on UK communities. The Guardian reports nuclear waste dumps can be imposed on local communities without their support under a new law rushed through in the final hours of Parliament. Under the latest rules, the long search for a place to store Britain's stockpile of 50 years' worth of the most radioactive waste from power stations, weapons, and medical use can be ended by bypassing local planning. The move went barely noticed as it was passed late on the day before Parliament was prorogued for the general election, but has alarmed local objectors and anti-nuclear campaigners. So even a few government MPs broke ranks to vote against the move. Zach Goldsmith criticized the lack of public debate about such a big change, saying, quote, Effectively, it strips local authorities of the ability to stop waste being dumped in their communities. If there had been a debate, there could have been a different outcome. Most of the MPs who voted probably didn't know what they were voting for. The only existing high-level radioactive underground waste storage is in New Mexico, USA, and it's been closed since last year following two accidents. Germany has, has put similar plans for burying high-level waste on hold, and other countries, including France and James, Japan, are examining the idea. And James, I, I was interested to kind of wonder about the difference between, because it mentions 
power station waste and military weapons waste and also medical waste. And can we get at what the what the difference is between some of those things? Well, the difference in terms of the actual products, um, basically, when you're talking about the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle in reactors, you're talking about more beta and gamma emitters, as well as the actinide, the alpha emitters. But when you're talking about nuclear waste from weapons, when uh, weapon decommissioning, you're talking about the product of the fissile materials, which is plutonium-239 um, primarily, which is, of course, a, an alpha emitter. So it's going to be more alpha emitter or heavy when it uh, when it comes to nuclear weapon decommissioning although it's interesting the uh, we've talked uh, I've talked many times in the past about how the nuclear uh, uh, power program is really just an adjunct of the nuclear weapons industry they of course use the reactors as convenient ways to get the fissile material for the bombs but it goes the other way as well when they decommission the weapons they can then make that highly enriched uranium into low enriched uranium which they can then use in reactors which is exactly what they uh, did with the some of the old Russian warheads in the megaton to megawatt program that supposedly came to an end a couple of years ago but um, so they were doing that for a couple of decades. Um, and it's interesting. Um, this story is particularly interesting because I'm sure people uh, who are watching this program are very fixated on what's happening in Fukushima. And as I've said many times before, I think the nuclear industry couldn't have asked for a better distraction from what's going on in the backyards of a lot of different people than Fukushima. Concentrate on this happening halfway around the globe. Don't w concentrate on what's happening in your backyard, perhaps quite literally in this case, your backyard. And on that note, James, do you have any idea what is the most radioactive sea in the world? You got me. The Irish Sea. Why? Because of the Sellafield nuclear power plant uh, uh, pumping 8 million liters of radioactive water into the into the Irish Sea a day. Um, again, th these types of things most most people probably don't know about and don't think about because they've just been going on for decades and it's not it's not a meltdown situation, so it's all perfectly fine, right? Well, no, radioactive waste is radioactive waste no matter where it's coming from or how it's being uh, delivered into the environment and it is being delivered into the environment. So, I hope British people are at least up on this story and at least looking into what's happening right now and uh, and being aware of this and the fact that uh, you uh, have some significant radiation problems there as well. Mm -hmm. And and the story was submitted to us via the UK of, of one of our folks that uses hashtag New World Next Week at Daz Alt Theory. And so, James, I do have a couple of, of related notes on that. You did mention F Fukushima, and there are new reports of Fukushima radiation detected on the shores of Vancouver Island, which is, of course, just north of me here in Portland, Oregon. And speaking of Portland, Oregon, our Portland Sustainability Commission has given sort of the initial go-ahead to a propane terminal here. So that's our Sustainability Commission getting the ball rolling to opening, opening up this sort of propane terminal. Now it essentially goes on to the Portland City Council, and that's the same body that attempted to bypass the public and fluoridate the water here two years ago. So we have all of those things kind of kind of swirling around. And again, James, I think in a lot of ways the stories we try and cover here on New World Next Week aren't necessarily always the big headline stories. They may be smaller things going on in a particular region or area. And we use that to kind of shine a light and say, imagine what may be going on, just as you said, in quite literally your own, your own backyard. Now, having said all of that, let's move to our third and final segment this week, where we this week get to the good news. And we call it good news next week. Creative Commons launches open business models initiative. This from shareable.net, and in January they wrote about Team Open, a project documenting some artists, teachers, scientists, all using Creative Commons licenses to share their work. So since then, Creative Commons launched a new project to help entrepreneurs, organizations, governments use Creative Commons licenses and still generate income. So this Creative Commons Open Business Models Initiative aims to show how Creative Commons licenses can be used to create financially sustainable organizations. So the most frequently asked question of the Creative Commons team, how do I earn a living, pay the bills, and keep the lights on if I openly license my work and give it away for free? And I wonder, James, if perhaps you could tackle that question, as, as I think you, you're a, a model of this. Well, that, that's exactly my point. Yes, it can be done, and it is being done by people like myself. People might know, or maybe they don't, but if you look down at the bottom of CorbettReport.com, you'll see on every page that it is a Creative Commons uh, 4.0 
um, attribution, non-commercial license, meaning, yeah, you're free to repost, republish, use this information, mix it, do whatever you want with it. Obviously, don't try to sell it as your own and don't, uh, and please uh, include a link back to the site. But other than that, please use this information. And uh, and that's that's the model I use. And look, I'm living, breathing proof that it can work, that people will support this work if, you, uh, if you're doing the work. And, uh, and so it, it can happen. It is happening. I'm so glad that things like this are occurring and these, these open business models are being tried out right now. As I've talked about recently on the program, it is the peer-to-peer economy. It is truly revolutionizing the way that we can do business, the way we think about business, what business even means, how business can be more community oriented than simply, uh, you know, working for some corporation. There are so many possibilities that are opened up by this type of these ideas. They're not just technologies, they're ideas that underlie a different economic system. And again, I'm living, breathing proof that it can work. So, uh, so I hope people at least check into this story and, uh, and start thinking of if they can apply this in their own work, if they can apply this to their own ideas. And, uh, and maybe, maybe there's a way that you can revolutionize your own life using some of this idea. Well, and and we'll we'll perhaps touch on that at, at the very end. I've got a couple of other related good news notes here, James. Sacramento City Council approves urban farm ordinance, and we've got some more solutions on guerrilla gardening. Again, something that our man Brock West has been doing in some ways of just working on making a garden where you are. We've got good news stories about walkable suburbs. Again, less cars, more walkable, and they discover hey, this actually makes our towns and communities come alive. An interesting one, James, I got from you on your Twitter account. Chinese government tried to regulate public dancing but failed when the grannies fought back. And that's got a fantastic photo that we'll include for you here. And one note as well from Australia, mobile laundromat created to help the homeless there. So those are some of the good ideas and good news next week stories that we try and follow is, again, we made we made the pledge at the very beginning of 2015, James, that every episode of Neural Next Week this year would include a segment of good news because we do want to be solutions-oriented. Now, it's hard enough, James, to keep up with what's going down when we're on week after week, but you and I had a couple of weeks off, and there's no way to keep up with all the stories. But there's a couple of other headlines I do want to mention as things that we've been following here on New World Next Week with the audience's help by using hashtag New World Next Week. Prince Andrew's sex abuse claims have been thrown out by a Florida judge. Meanwhile, mainstream British media Channel 4 reports MI5 allow child abuse cover-up. Meanwhile, AstraZeneca accused of testing anti-psych drugs with horrific results. Johns Hopkins faces a billion-dollar class lawsuit over knowingly infecting Guatemalans with STDs. And that's a story we first reported for you here as it started over three years ago as the U.S. tried to argue they were immune from Guatemalan lawsuits. That's January 2012. A new research from an NGO says the war on terror killed at least millions of people from 2003 to 2013. Yemen's being obliterated by the Saudis. The media silence here, James, in the States is pretty amazing and deafening. Operation Jade Helm is freaking out the Internet. And get this, Rand Paul, the new and latest presidential selection candidate, says big news is coming on the Clinton Foundation and it will shock people. And if you watch New World Next Week, you got that story last month from these independent and commercial-free episodes. James, you make videos and write. I make music mixtapes and and headlines. And just as you were noting, if folks out there want to support our work, any donation or subscription is greatly appreciated, and it helps keep us going and growing, James. It certainly does. And on that note, let's wrap it up for another week. James Corbett, uh, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, thank you so much for your work. Thanks, buddy.